Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Thank you, Lord. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. If he's that to you, sing. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. One more. Waymaker, waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Thank you, Lord. If that's who he is in your life, just give God some praise on this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, and the light in the darkness. Those are some attributes that it's hard to find in anybody, but you get them all in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We're going to go ahead and get into this word. If you could go with me to the book of John. Chapter 13, verses 36 through 38. That's John 13, 36 through 38. And when you have it, say amen. 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 John 13, 36 through 38. Amen. And it reads, Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I go now, Lord? He asked, I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, die for me. I'll tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. The NIV version says, disown me. Uh, the, the, the message for today is... Are you really? Are you really? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Are you really? Peter said, Lord, I am ready to die for you. And Jesus is probably like, are you really? As a matter of fact, before the rooster crows tomorrow three times, you're going to deny me. And oftentimes we get ourselves to a place to where we're saying we're willing to do all these things for the Lord. But God is saying, are you really? It's easy to say that we're going to do this or do this for uh, do that for God when things are going swell and things are and everything is smooth sailing. But when you come up against a little bit of opposition or a little bit of pressure or things are just a little funny acting, are you really? Are you really? To, uh, are you really going to do the things that you said you're going to do? Are you going to stand the way you said you're going to stand? Are you going to move the way that you said you're going to move? You have to ask yourself: Am I really? Are you really? The word deny means to refuse to admit the truth or the existence of, to refuse to acknowledge. And that's what Peter did in that particular time. He refused to acknowledge that he even knew who Jesus was, that he was a, a, a follower and a disciple of Jesus. He denied that fact when he was faced with a little pressure. Peter was like many of us today. We're bold after an encounter with the Lord or when we're around our leaders, or maybe with some strong brothers and sisters in Christ. But what happens when no one else is around? What happens when you get faced with worldly pressures and the heat gets turned up on you? Uh, how will you act? How, you, how will you face those pressures? Will you stay bold? Will you remember God's word? Will you continue to stand? Or will you deny Jesus like Peter did? What would you do when you're all alone amongst a group of people who don't believe the same way that you and I believe? When they don't talk the way you and I talk, when they don't move the way that you and I move, are you still going to remain bold? Or are you going to cower down and are you going to deny Jesus? Because every time we, we begin to function as the world, that means we're denying Jesus. Every time we begin to move like the world, talk like the world, indulge in a worldly conversation or, or manner, we're denying Jesus. To truly accept Christ and his ways, we must first learn to humble ourselves and push our prideful, selfish ways to the side to really learn and understand what lessons are being taught. It's the humble spirit that's going to allow us to really receive what the Lord is trying to do. You can't have a, 
a, a, a, a standoff of spirit and think you're going to receive all of what God has for us. It doesn't work like that. We have to push a lot of that stuff to, a side, to the side to receive what he has for us. You know how, how we are as worldly are people and carnal people. We have adopted habits that are Christ-like sometimes. We are bullheaded. We are hard-headed. We are strong-minded. We won't accept things, you know, if we're not... Uh, if, we're, if we don't feel that we're, we're heading in the right direction or if we don't quite understand what God is saying, then we, we, we want to buck up against it. And we can't truly receive what God has if we have that kind of mindset and lifestyle. So we have to learn to humble ourselves and push ourselves out of the way so God can truly work in us. In John chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, Jesus was doing just that. He was teaching the disciples a lesson in humility. Now, this is what was known as the Last Supper. We know that Jesus met with all the disciples, and he began to break bread with all of them and kind of give them some last remarks and some last teachings before he was going to go. But we saw, even within this example, that Peter still needed some extra cares, a little extra uh, uh, attendant to uh, within this. You know, it's like a kid. You might have several children, and all of them learn how to mind you the, perfect, the right way. But there's usually always one they're trying to push the limits just a little bit just to see if they can get an edge or see if all the rules still apply to them like it does everybody else. To see if you're going to come down on me and if I don't truly follow the rules like you've told everybody else to do it. That was kind of like Peter. He was like the, the, the kid where you know there's so much potential within that kid, but at the same time with it, that potential always leads him to be a little bit more strong-minded and strong-willed. That's Peter. And if we look at verse 4, the word says... Uh, John 13, verse 4, says, So Jesus got up from the table, took off his robe, and wrapped a towel around his waist. He poured water into the basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel he had around him. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, why are you going to wash my feet? Now this, first of all, the question should be, Peter, why are you questioning the Lord? Also, it says, when it came to Peter, that means that he was not the first in line. So some other people had already went through having their feet washed. But you know that bullheaded child, that one's a little different. They want to stand out and be like, well, why are you going to wash my feet? Sometimes we say things and we do things thinking that we're trying to be uh, humble or exalt somebody else. And in the, in the midst of that, we're missing the lesson that Jesus was trying to do. Pete, why are you going to wash my feet? Peter protested. Then he said, had the nerve to say, you will never wash my feet. Boy, Peter was bold right there, wasn't he? Not only are you questioning why are you washing my feet, but then to have the nerve to say, you will never wash my feet, as if to say, I respect you enough, Jesus, that I will never let you bow down and do something like this to me. All the while missing the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach them in humility. If I am willing to bow down and wash all of your feet, then let's believe that you should be willing to do the same and even more. Because I am of God. You guys are of me or came through me. So if I'm willing to do these things, that means you must be willing to do that and more. Peter missed the mark. So Peter was like, uh, then Jesus said, if you don't, uh, then Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then you won't belong to me. Hmm. That's a stark rebuttal if you ask me. If you don't allow me to do what I've come to do, then you won't belong to me. So Peter was, after he learned that, Peter was like, well, if that's the case, go ahead and wash my hands, my head, and my feet. Wash my whole body. They only got their feet washed. So now, Peter, the, the, the hard-headed one, the strong-willed one, now he's going from one extreme to the other. That's like us sometimes when we just can't get right, we go from one extreme to the other. So now he goes from, you will never wash my feet, to say, okay, well, wash me all over. And again, this is another learning lesson. Jesus said, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet. Meaning if you've truly accepted of me, meaning you've got the spirit inside of you, you've learned of me, you, you believe in me, you have faith and obey me, then you, you, then you don't need to be washed all over. You're going to go someplace and go into some lands that's going to require you to dust the, the, uh, take the dust off your feet, to wash your feet, because they will get dirty. But your spirit, as long as you stay in me, will never get filthy. Right. It will never need to be washed as long as as you remain in me. And it, uh, it goes on to say, you will never need to uh, wash except for your feet to be entirely clean. And then it goes on to say, though Peter had some, excuse me, lost my place here. 
You will never need to, you will never be entirely clean unless I wash your feet. And are you clean? But that does not, that's not true of everyone. So he acknowledged that Peter was clean, that he only needed to have his feet washed. And somebody might say, well, why would Jesus still treat Peter like this, even though he was the one giving, uh, giving him all the heartache, the one that was continually questioning him, the one that was a little shaky? Well, there's a reason for that. Just because our kids do that, that don't mean that they don't love us. That don't mean that they don't respect us. They just try. Sometimes they just need to learn. Not that you can't teach every child the exact same way. Some people learn at a different place. And Jesus saw the potential in Peter. Jesus knew that Peter was going to be the one to lead the church, to start the church. So he just had to groom him more. So he was not going to say, well, you're just like somebody else or you're not good enough. He had the teaching. And that's like our children right now. We might have to work with Micah a little different than we do with Mariah. Mariah might get it a little faster than what Micah does or what Matt or Maddie does. But that does not mean they won't get it. You know, if they don't get it at the particular time, it's not for us to say, well, you'll never get it. You just keep on training until they do get it, because once it catches on, you never know what they're going to be able to do with that knowledge and that information. And that's what Jesus did with Peter. Though Peter had some ways about him, some growing up to do, Jesus never got down on Peter because he understood Peter's heart was pure. He wasn't trying to be defiant. He just didn't quite understand. He didn't quite catch on the way the other one did. He wasn't as Peter was more of a, a fighter, a go-getter. So sometimes when you have that spirit, you're not as submissive. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. As a matter of fact, spiritually, it's not a bad thing at all because it will allow you to go into places and do things that some people that have a more passive spirit aren't as willing to do. Peter had a strong and a bold spirit. He was just a little immature in certain areas and even within his walk with Jesus. Just a little immaturity. So that's when, uh, when he said all the disciples are clean. Jesus said all the disciples are clean except one, which we know wound up being Jesus, who, uh, Judas, who portrayed Jesus. Everything Jesus did, he did with intent. He didn't do anything just for the sake of doing it. He did everything with intent. That was to teach, to grow, to save, to heal, and to strengthen. Peter, uh, Jesus did, like I said, he did everything with intent. Sometimes we'll We'll waste energy doing this just to say we did it or just to do this or that. Jesus didn't do that. He knew his time here was short. So when he did everything, he did everything with extreme intent to make sure that the disciples got what he was trying to get. And that was something that Peter, just being immature, he didn't understand that a little bit better. He, that's why I was saying he didn't quite catch on as fast as the other disciples. He caught on, but he was just a little bit, you know, headstrong. So as we move along further in the road, down the road, we know that Judas had made up his mind to betray Jesus. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen, and the fulfillment of the pro prophecy of his betrayal and death was upon him. Jesus tells his disciples he's going to be leaving soon. If you look in the, uh, the 36th verse of John chapter 13, Peter says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. Verse 37 says, but why can't I go now, Lord? He said, I'm ready to die for you. Like what we got out of our focus verse. Jesus answered, die for me. Know this, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. So what happens oftentimes is when we're in the presence of strength or in the presence of the anointing or the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, we have our boldness on full display. So when Peter was right in the presence of Jesus or with Jesus, you know, he was a little bit more bold in what he was doing because he knew he had the big man right behind him. And sometimes that's how we are as well. When we're in the presence of strength and the presence of the, of the spirit and the presence of strong people, then we want to be bold too. It's like that little brother uh, who's out there talking all that stuff because he knows his big brother's not going to allow anything to happen to him. So that's kind of like Peter. You know, he, he's a little bold when he knew Jesus was around because if nothing else, he knew Jesus was there to correct and fix the situation. Uh, so just like Peter, when we when we in these situations, do we do we deny? Do we cower down? Or do or we, when we're not in the presence or directly around people who have strength, do we remain bold? Do we remain strong because we know that Jesus is still with us wherever we go? We we are supposed to be take strength, power, authority with us everywhere we go. That's because we should have the Holy Spirit dwelling down on the inside. That's why it's so important that we get into this word, that we fast, that we pray, that we do everything that we're supposed to do or that we can do to receive that strength. We should have it on the inside. Peter was a powerful man 
and a powerful disciple. But he had, early on, he had struggles. That was when he was not directly in the presence of Jesus. And sometimes he would have, you know, a few struggles even when he was around Jesus, like we learned when we went through this word. He just had some areas, again, immaturity. That's why they, they consider people babes in Christ and leveling up in different things because there are levels to this walk. You're not going to know everything as soon as you get in it. But the thing is, you have to try to remain faithful to it even in the things that you don't understand. You can't get down on yourselves when you don't quite understand or when somebody has a better understanding of the word of God. That's quite all right. That's why Jesus had to walk with the disciples for almost uh, for a little over three years to groom them because he understood that it was going to take some time to get them to a place to where they could go and live this life and do what he's called them to do. And that's just like all of us in here. We all start at different points. We all learn in different ways. Just because somebody might catch on a little faster than the other one doesn't mean that you're not where you need to be. Just keep on foc uh, keep your focus on Jesus. Keep doing what he's called you to do and he will, you will get there. You will get there. I remember when uh, in the story where Peter lost faith. He, uh, when Jesus called him uh, uh, on the sea, the, the stormy sea. And we lose faith sometimes. It's, it's not uncommon. So Jesus, uh, Peter was, they were out of the sea. Jesus was not with them. And they were going across the sea. We all know the story where Peter, they're in there and, and it's rocky and everything. And they see an image walking on the sea. And Peter says to Jesus, Lord, if that be you, bid me come. And what does Jesus do? He says, okay, come on. And we know Peter got out of the boat. Uh, uh, Matthew 14, by the way, starting at 28, says then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you, walking on the water. 29 says, yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong winds and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. And then he says, save me, Lord, he shouted. Verse 31 says, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why do you doubt me? So again, while he was saw Jesus, when his mind was focused on Jesus, he was able to do things that normally he wouldn't be able to do. That's like us sometimes when we, we have our minds focused on Jesus we're able to accomplish the things that God has called for us to do. But when we take our eyes and our minds off of him and we start looking at the storms that surround in our lives, that's when we begin to sink. See, Peter was not focused. He was focused on Jesus, but he started, it says he starts seeing the waves and the things crashing before him. Those things, those storms sometimes can scare you out of walking for God. What we have to understand is just because we're going through a storm doesn't mean we're not going to go through a storm. We oftentimes quit walking when, we're, when we get in the midst of the storm. But if you keep your mind focused on Jesus, you don't know how close you're, you're walking to coming out of that storm. Jesus, uh, Peter had every, he, we don't know how close he was to Jesus. But what we do know is he didn't have faith enough to keep his mind focused to get there. Jesus said, okay, come on and come out. But then he had to rebuke him and say, you have so little faith. Do you have enough faith to make it through your storms this morning? Do you have enough faith to see when things ain't quite going right in your life, when you're facing a little bit of heartache, the kids ain't quite acting right, I got a little pain in my body, things are going on in the job, the home is a little rocky. Do you have enough faith to believe that Jesus can bring you through the storm? Keep your minds and your eyes focused on him and he will bring you all the way through it. And that's what uh, Peter failed to do. And Jesus said, oh, what little faith. But this is the one that's really the kicker. Why did you doubt me? Hmm. If you asked me for something and I told you I'm going to do it or that you can do it, why did you begin to doubt if you believe what I said from the get-go? We get like that sometimes. We believe that Jesus said he's going to do something in our lives. We begin to uh, uh, walk in that thing and then when it gets a little bit shaky, then we don't believe Jesus no more. We don't believe that he said he's going to do it. Or we don't believe that he truly said it. We begin to doubt. Did he really say it in the first place? Did he really tell us he's going to bring us through? Did he really tell us he's going to take us there? Did he really tell us he's going to anoint us to that area? Did he really do it? But then Jesus said, why did you doubt me? Why did you doubt me? The word, what does the word say? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So you have to have faith, belief that he's really going to do what he said he's going to do. Keep your mind and your eyes focused on Jesus. 
So as we get back into the word, we go to verse 18 uh, of John. This is where Ju uh, Judas had sold Jesus out and when Jesus was arrested. Here, again, Peter tries to take matters into his own hands and draws a sword and cuts off the ear of Malchus, the high priest servant. Imagine this. Uh, Jesus is essentially giving himself up to fulfill the will of the Heavenly Father, and Peter took it upon himself to try to protect Jesus and, and, and prevent him from being from the prophecy to be fulfilled, from him being crucified. Can you imagine that? Uh, 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 Jesus telling us to do something, we take it upon ourselves to, to, to go an uh, opposite route, just like Peter did. He cut off the ear thinking he was protecting Jesus when Jesus had, a, had a, uh, something he had to do in the first place. Can, just, just imagine that. But one thing that's so beautiful about Jesus, when Peter cut off Malchus's ear, and I heard this not long ago, that that was a, a offense to be put by death. So now Jesus was already on his way to be crucified, and Peter acting like he did, he by right, he should have been put to death as well because he assaulted a, a member of the high council. And by Jewish law back then, he should have been put to death as well. But when Jesus picked up that ear and put it back on Malchus, he, all, he, he took away all the evidence of Peter's offense. Ain't that a blessing? Ain't that the, the type of God that we serve that'll take away all the evidence of our past offense, the things that we've done in this world, so nobody can keep going back to how you used to be, but only focus on what you are right now. What an awesome God that we serve. So now he picks up the ear, puts it back on Malcolm, uh, Malchus, removes all evidence, and allows the prophecy to go forth. Peter could have messed up a whole lot of stuff. Because if he had been killed, now the church, who knows how the church would have been started back then when Jesus knew that Peter was supposed to be, the, 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 uh, the church was supposed to be built upon his back. That he was supposed to be the leader of the new coming church. So again, Peter in his haste and his zeal, he almost messed things up, but Pe Jesus was there to fix it, just like he does in our lives. Could you imagine if Peter had his way and slayed all the men that came to arrest Jesus? If Jesus had never made it to the cross, Imagine how this world would be. Imagine what it would be like right now. Imagine what we would be going through right now. Many people thought the pandemic was, was horrible. And it was. Many people think that that was the worst that we, they've ever seen and that we've ever been through. And to a certain degree it was. But if Jesus had never made it to that cross, I can't imagine what this world would be like now. Many of us probably wouldn't be here. It would probably be like a New Age apocalypse. You see movies where you see the apocalyptic world and everything is in ruins and everything is all torn down. And a great example is the the, uh, the book of Eli. If Jesus had not yet made it to, had not made it to the cross, I can only imagine that the world would be just like the book of Eli. Every man for himself. Every man scrounging, fighting just to try to make make it to the next day. But glory be to God that Jesus had a, a, a had a plan and an appointment, and He saw fit to fulfill that appointment. Like Peter, we get so caught up sometimes trying to prove something that we don't wait to see what God's will is truly for our lives. We're so hasty that we just move instead of wait to see what God is trying to tell us to do. Peter was stuck on actions and works, actions and works, actions and works, instead of humility, learning, receiving, and accepting. Many people think that that's all it takes to make it into heaven is doing a bunch of works and, and going, well, I'm at every outreach and I'm at every service and I'm doing all these things. But you got to have your heart right to make it to him. you got to accept Jesus and have your uh, heart right to get to Jesus to make it to God. That's what the word tells us to do. Uh, some of the very things that make up our foundation is, to, is learning to be humble, to learn, to receive, and accept. If you deny those things, you deny yourself the ability to defeat the enemy and do God's will. You have to have humility in order to receive and learn. And if you deny him, you're, you're missing out. You're denying yourself to make it to him. Jesus says, shall I not drink of this cup the Father has given me? Basically saying, am I supposed to deny the wishes, and, the wishes and plans of my Father to make sure that you feel good about yourself and that you can get some glory? Am I supposed to deny God's will so you can, I can say, well, look what Peter did. He slayed these people, so I'm still here. No. Jesus saying, I've got an appointment. And it's not always going to feel good, and you all have an appointments too. They may not always feel good, but it's your job to follow through what the Father has for you. And just like I have, it's my job to follow through on the appointment that God has for me. Now, Jesus is arrested and taken to the temple of the high priest. Peter and another disciple followed behind Jesus to the temple 
uh, they were, but they were not led in. The other disciple knew a high priest and was allowed to go into the courtyard, and so he was able to get Peter in as well. This is the first time where we know that Peter actually denied Jesus. If I, but I like the wording, so I'm going to read out of the, uh, the wording in Matthew because it tells the same story like it does in John, but I like the wording in Matthew a little better. So in Matthew chapter 26, verse 69 through uh, 74, and it reads, Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, You are one of those with Jesus, the Galilean. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. See, this is the first time you deny Jesus. And that's just like us sometimes. This is how it starts. You let little things come in, and you be, that's how sin begins to start in your life. It starts with liking and sharing posts that you shouldn't like and share. It starts with liking things that are not of God and indulging in conversations and rhetoric that you have no business being in, condoning things that go against God, knowing things that, that are completely against God, but since the world says it's okay, then you begin to turn a blind eye to it and say, well, it must be okay if everybody else is doing it too. That's how you first begin to deny God. It's the little things. You let them watching things you shouldn't watch, allowing your kids to watch things they shouldn't watch. Allow your kids to listen to things they shouldn't listen to. Again, making uh, laughing at little jokes that you shouldn't be laughing at. Sharing posts that are offensive to other people. That's how the things start. Then it goes on to say, but later out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said uh, to those standing around, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it. I don't even know the man, he said. So now he's getting a little bit more bold in his denial. He's getting a little, that's when you begin to share pictures with, in, in places that you shouldn't be. That's when you begin to uh, hang out with people you shouldn't hang out with, tag them in post, and be like, we kicked it last night. Or, or knowing that you somebody has been a, a, a vice or a hindrance to you in the past, but then you pick up the phone and call them again and be like, you know what, I was just thinking about you. I was just wondering how, how are things going on in your life. Now you're getting a little bit more bold with it. Now you're not, you're not even going to church or you're saying it's okay to skip or miss. All these things that you're doing now, now you're denying Jesus even more. It started out with the small things, but now I'm, I'm moving on to the big things to where I'm denying him in your presence. When I should be in church, but I make a post uh, at the time you should be in church at a restaurant because it's happy hour and it's brunch. Denying Jesus. Like Peter denying Jesus. As the word goes on, it says, a little later, some other bystanders came out over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. And this is uh, the, the, the rooster crowed. And this is where kind of like the world tries to let us know when we've fallen that far away and they know that we're supposed to be of God. They said, I can tell you're one of them by the way that you talk. I can tell that you're one of them by your Galilean next. I know that you're with Jesus by the way that you sound. Have you ever met somebody who's been in church their whole entire life or they've grown up in church and then they, they say, you know what, I don't want to do this church thing no more and they just stick out like a sore thumb? They, talk, they try to get in conversations and they sound out of place. The way they talk sounds out of place. Even if they attempt to curse, it don't sound right coming out of their mouth. That's when the world lets you know Look, you're trying to do something that you're not even called to do. You're living a life that you're not called to live. We should be trying to be like you, and here it is, you trying to be like us. Boy, get somewhere and sit down and get back in church. Girl, get somewhere and get uh, sit down and get back to, to God. You don't even sound like what you like us. That's crazy. And that's what people do. I don't even know you. I don't even know him. But they said, yeah, I can tell by the way you say I can tell by the way you move. I, you one of them. And if somebody's willing enough to sit there and see that in us, take it for what it is and say, you know what, I messed up. You're right. I'm going back. Because if you still have some of the remnants and the residue on you, that's still a good thing. Get back to God where you belong. You don't even sound right. Peter got three chances to claim Jesus and refuse to acknowledge Jesus uh, uh, every single time, just as Jesus said that he would. Even though Jesus was near, Peter didn't believe enough deep down in his soul to prevent him from denying Jesus. Peter allowed fear to, uh, allowed fear to allow him to deny even knowing his Lord and Savior. What's our reason? Why do we deny? What reason do we have in him? Is it fear? Is it shame? Is it guilt thinking that we've gone too far gone and we can't get back to him? 
Is it that our friends are not going to, they're going to think we're funny acting, they're going to think we're weird if we love the Lord? Is it that my, my fellow co-workers and employees ain't going to understand because there's so many more of them than it is of us? Stand up and stand out. You, if you'll never be alone, if nothing else, you'll have Jesus with you every single time. The word says immediately the rooster crowed and Jesus looked at Peter and Peter ran off weeping. Could you imagine being Peter? Could you imagine that? Jesus says, you're going to deny me. And you say, I'm never going to deny you. As a matter of fact, I'm willing to die for you. Like the, the, the title of the message, are you really? Are you really? Since after it, it, the rooster immediately crowed, but then could you imagine Jesus looking at you while you're letting him down, you're denying him? Could you imagine you just getting a glimpse of Jesus staring at you in the midst of you denying him? My God. See, then the word says, then Peter ran away weeping bitterly. I can imagine. We mess up on a daily basis. That's why we need to repent and crucify ourselves in this flesh every single day. But the thing is, we don't think that we don't, we don't keep Jesus around enough to believe that he's watching everything that we do. We need to get to a place that we believe that Jesus is in the room wherever we go. So that when we're doing something we know we ain't got no business, we would be ashamed for him to be looking at us doing what we're doing. I can only imagine some of us doing some of the things or talking, how we talk or watching something and just knowing that Jesus is watching. We would never attempt, we probably wouldn't even turn the TV on to watch some of the stuff we watch if we knew Jesus was in the room. And we would never even talk the way we talk at a, we go through the drive through and you, hello, thank you. I know I'm wrong for that and I need forgiveness for that. But if Jesus was with me and I knew he was with me, would you think I would just be like, boy, you ain't, you having a bad day? No. So we need to make sure that we conduct ourselves like Jesus is right with us everywhere we go because he should be with us everywhere that we go. I can only imagine what he went through. But look at this verse. This is Luke chapter 22, verse 31. You can just write it down. And Jesus already knew what was, he knew it was going to happen, but he already knew that Peter was going to have some faults. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. It says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift, seek, to sift each of you like we. But this is, third, this is the kicker, 32. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. My God, my God, my God. Now, he says, I've pleaded in prayer for you. You know Jesus is pleading in prayer for us? Do you know that he prays for us? That he's, uh, he's rooting for us, that he's a, uh, being uh, accountant for us, and, and being an ambassador for us to the Father. Can you imagine? Do you know that? That Jesus is that is rooting for us up there to do well, to make it to him? He said, I've pleaded in prayer for you that your faith should not fail. Because you're going to be facing with some stuff. And that's what happened to Peter when he was on that boat. His faith failed. When he went, went when he denied Jesus. His faith failed. He said, but then, this, this is the beautiful thing, but when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers, because you're going to fall, and we fall sometimes. But Jesus says, when you repent and turn to me again, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen yourself. Strengthen those that are around you. Thank you, Jesus. What a God that we serve. Now, we know what took place after that. Jesus was crucified, and he rose from the dead, just like he said he would. Mark 16 and 6 uh, goes on to say, But the angel of the Lord said, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Look, this is where his body lay. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. So we go on to uh, John chapter 21. Peter and some of the other disciples were fishing in the Sea of Galilee. They have been having a tough day and fishing was hard and the Lord appeared to them and told them to cast their nets on the other side. So familiar when he first met them, isn't it? When they were out there doing what they knew to do, the things that they knew to do naturally very well, they were doing it again. He says, cast their net to the other side and they were blessed with more fish than they could bring in. Once they realized it was Jesus who had spoken to them, the word says, Peter jumped into the water and swam to the shore. When he got there, it says, a fire was burning and there was fish cooking with bread. Jesus told Peter, bring some of the fish that he just caught so that he could, he told the disciples to come 
and have breakfast. Still being a servant. Knowing that I've been denied my peer. Knowing that my very people that I was brought to this earth to save want to be crucified. And here it is. Jesus comes back from the dead. And one of the first things he does is to be a servant again. Could you imagine Peter or Jesus being on the bank, roasting some fish and making some bread for you, knowing good and well that you, you call yourself turning away from God? I, I, I denied Jesus. There's no way he'll accept me back. There's no, I denied him. There's no way he'll want me back. But if you read on, if you read the word, there's a scripture where it talks about where he told uh, one of the people to go tell the disciples that, I, that I've risen and Peter too. So he knew Peter had made up his mind that you know, there's no way I could go back to God because I denied him. But Jesus is saying, I still want you, even though you don't think I do, I'm letting you know that I still want you. So go tell the other disciples that I'm, that I'm back. And Peter too. Thank you, Jesus. So after he made breakfast, uh, Peter, uh, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than these? Jesus had to humble Peter and, reaffir and be also reaffirming to him. Do you love me? Remember, Peter was boasting in Matthew 26 where uh, he was like, I, I, I'm going to die for you. I, I, I'm going to do all these things. Do you, so Jesus had to humble him, bring him down a notch, but still reaffirm his place and reaffirm him within him. 33 says that though they may all fall away, I will never fall away from you. This is when Peter, uh, Peter was saying, Jesus told him, there's going to be some that let's fall all away. And Peter was like, but they may all fall, but I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to be here with you no matter what. So Jesus, okay, remember when you said that? Remember when you, when you boldly said all these things to me that you stood up in the middle of everybody and said, I'm not going to do this or for God I live, for God I die, and then you ran away? Okay, remember you said that. But the next chance you get, don't be so bold. You don't have to speak with your mouth. I don't need to hear it out of your mouth. Let me see you walking. I, I, let me see how you live it. It's your living that's way more important to me than your talking right now. So essentially he was saying to Peter, but are you still saying that you love me more than these others do? Or do you think that you love me more than the others do? Peter, was tried, uh, Peter always tried to gauge love based on what he said or how the other ones acted in comparison or how he acted in comparison to the other disciples. Again, works in action, works in action. Some people think they love God more because they can give more or they always show up and stuff. That doesn't mean anything. You know the script, how the scripture goes where it says there's the woman who brought one sin in and gave it to church and the other man brought a ton of money. And they say, who do you think was blessed more? Well, the woman that gave that one sin because she gave all that she had. And this other guy that just gave up out of the abundance that he had. So it's not the abundance that you do, it's the heart that you do it in that's going to be pleasing to God. Peter was truly realized that this thing was bigger than him. This, this whole situation was bigger than him. Jesus said, then feed my lambs and make sure the babes get it. Make sure the babes in Christ consume the word. Preach the word in the new church. I love this because Jesus is reminding Peter of why he chose him from the get-go. I need you to feed the people. The new church is going to be started on you. You're going to be the one going around. You're going to face some stuff, but the new ones that are coming in, the ones who might not catch on, I need you to make sure that they eat. I need you to make sure that they get it. I need you to make sure that they get this word. Then Jesus asked Peter again, do you love me? Peter responded, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus then says, well, take care of my sheep. Make sure they're okay, able to sustain for themselves as well as help others. Continue to teach them and reinforce the lessons that have already been learned and already been taught to them. Jesus asked Peter a third time. And, uh, uh, and the word says, Peter was grieved and Jesus would ask him for a third, a third time the same question. Do you love me? Then he says, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said, well, feed my house. Some of us have obedience issues. Some of us deny Jesus from time to time. Some of us have faith issues that don't truly believe that God can and will do what he said he can do. We can't get our minds around it. But Jesus said, I still want you. Follow me. How he, uh, even though he knew all these things, that's why he brought G, uh, Peter into the world. That's why Jesus was brought into the world. Because he knew that we had so many shortcomings, so it was going to be on his back, the back of Jesus, that we were able to overcome those things. When Jesus died on that cross, he died for all sin. He died with us to have the ability to overcome all sin and never be tempted by it. That's why Jesus came. Jesus has the blueprints to build the foundation that we need in this walk. 
He has the blueprints to build us up the way we need to be. He has the plans for our success against the enemy. He has the blueprints and plans for our lives. He knew us while we were in our parents' wombs. He knows everything about us, our shortcomings, our strong comings, and everything that we need to walk and talk and do the things that he needs us to do. We just have to follow his plan. He has the blueprints for our lives. We just have to accept his plan and stop denying him. We have to stop turning away from him. Stop denying Jesus. Accept the plan he has for us. Walk in it. Talk in it. Uh, uh, when, we have, when we fall, when we stumble, when Jesus says, follow me, say yes, sir, and get to going. We can't continue to fall back into our old ways, our old habits, or don't think that Jesus doesn't want us anymore because that's not the case. Jesus has proven time and time again, it's not him that turns away from us. It's us that turns away from him. And if you're tired of turning and that you know you have some shortcomings and you've turned one too many times and you want to get back to Christ, come down to the altar and we can pray with you. Jesus is in this place. Jesus is in this building. 